Good day everyone. Welcome to my channel on understanding finances and sports. In today's episode 4, we will discuss governance. So what's governance? It's the act or process of governing or overseeing the control and direction of something such as a country or a company or an organization such as a school or a sports club. Essentially, it's how you're managing an organization. The way I look at governance is that it's a process by which an organization, regardless of which organization it is, makes its decisions. So how does a company or a sports club or a school make decisions? That to me is the definition of governance. Every organization has a governance structure. So if you look at your corner grocery shop, it also has a governance structure. So for example, the recommendation to buy certain items or to replenish certain goods will come from the shop assistant who will go around, check the items and then say, look, we are running short of something or the other and I suggest we should buy it. The decision to buy the goods, let's say, is made by the wife of the shop owner who keeps a very keen eye on what's going on. So she's the person who actually approves the transaction. And then the shop owner, the poor husband, goes out and he makes the purchases and he tries to get the best price that he can. So he basically implements the decision. The key is the person who approves the transaction. So in this particular case, you've got the shop assistant who suggests, the wife who approves, and then the owner who goes out and implements. And this structure will probably work very well for us, you know, for a for a corner grocery shop. Similarly, at the other end of the scale, you could have the governance of very, very large organizations or for example, of a country. Now, when you look at a country, there are lots of people involved in making a decision at the national level. That could involve the president and the prime minister, obviously the Senate. You could have the parliament involved, various ministers, bureaucrats, civil servants, etc., etc. Obviously, this structure is a very, very complicated structure and it's a very high powered structure. So here, what I'm going to concentrate on is the process by which an organization makes its decisions. So why is governance in sports so important? Well, it's to improve the competence of the organization and therefore you want to make the right decisions for the sport. That's the only way that the sport is going to move forward. You need to stop corruption, favoritism, nepotism, bullying, doping, mismanagement, and all of this has been encountered by all the major sports. You need to put a stop to this, otherwise your sport isn't going to go anywhere. You need to create and set the culture of the organization. So for example, ideally speaking, you want to create a winning culture. You want to create a culture where you're not there just to compete, but you're there to win. And there are teams out there in history who you know are there purely to win. You've got athletes out there you know who are there not just to compete, but they are there to win. That's their only objective. So maybe that's the kind of culture you want for your organization or for your team. You want to create transparency so that the stakeholders are aware of what's going on and how decisions are made. Stakeholders could be, for example, the media, it could be your club members, it could be the entire country, you know, who are following your matches. And you need to create accountability to your stakeholders. So for example, you know, if your team is doing well or isn't doing well, then the responsibility should actually fall on uh, there should be a clear lines of responsibility so that people know who's accountable. And we must remember that most sport organizations are non-profit organization. 
This means that the governance should ensure that the organization spends its money where it's meant to be spent for the good of the sport. This is not your normal commercial organization that's there to make profit for its shareholders. It's there for a different reason. And therefore, the structure must be such that the money is spent in the right place to get the proper results. And another thing to remember is that your governance structure should be an enabler of good sporting decisions as well as good business decisions. It should not beg you back. It should encourage you to move forward, which is the next point as well. It should not hold the organization back through compliance and rules and regulations and red tape and bureaucracy. It should encourage the organization to achieve its objectives. And above all, it should allow your sport and the athletes to reach their true potential. That's very important. So let's look at the components of a governance structure for a large sports federation. You have your internal and external auditors. Sports organizations will appoint independent advisors. And then you have external consultants who are called on from time to time to uh, give their opinion and expertise on something. All of these in some way or the other do play a role in the organization, eventually making a decision on something. Obviously, you've got the management, which comprises the chief executive and the chief operating officer and his team. And they're the ones who are effectively the engine room of the organization. And it's very, very important to hire good people. This is also part of good governance, that you must hire very, very good people. You then have various committees. And these are the committees that vet the transactions and analyze the transactions that are put up by management. And this could be, for example, a finance committee, audit committee, and they analyze in detail the proposals that are put up by management, which then eventually go to the board of directors for approval. Your board uh, these days would normally be uh, including independent directors who are co-opted on, 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 onto the board um, and who are there because of their expertise and their independence of the organization so that you know they can actually uh, think clearly uh, without there being some kind of a vested interest. Obviously, at the end of the day, uh, the organization belongs to the shareholders and everyone's accountable ultimately to the shareholders. So obviously, they are part of the governance structure and there will normally be in place a delegation of authority and responsibility matrix. And this is the matrix and the document which specifies who has the authority to do what. So very simple example of this would be that, for example, the chief executive of the organization has the power to sign off on an expenditure of, let's say, $100,000 or a million dollars. Anything above that has to go to the finance committee who can then sign off uh, on an amount of $2 million and above $2 million, it has to go to the board of directors. So that's a very simple example of a delegation of authority uh, responsibility. And I certainly believe that the culture and direction of an organization comes from the, comes from the very top. If you have weak leaders, it's going to lead to a weak organization. There'll be weak decisions made and sometimes easy decisions made just because one doesn't want to make difficult decisions, which one has to do from time to time. And therefore, decisions will be made for the wrong reasons and the organization will suffer. On the other hand, if you've got political leaders, then your decisions will be politically motivated. It'll be for self-interest and therefore individuals will gain and the organization will suffer. So you have to have a strong and effective board of directors who understand and perform their role properly. They must be qualified for the job and have the relevant expertise. You may want to have 
directors from diverse backgrounds so that decisions can be debated from a variety of angles and then the right decision made. So you may want to have someone who's very qualified in finance, someone who's very qualified on the legal side, someone who's very qualified on the operational side, etc. They must have the interest of the organization at heart and therefore a lot of these directorships are not remunerated so that there is no financial benefit for the directors um, and they make the right decision purely in the interest of the organization. And they must hold management accountable in case things are going wrong at the operational level where things frequently do go wrong. Above all, I think one of the main job of a board of directors is to create a good governance model so that that model allows good decisions to be made. So let's look at how certain decisions could be made in a sports organization. Uh, let's say it's a matter concerning the sport itself. So it's something to do with a rule or regulation of the sport, maybe a change in the offside rule or maybe something to do with uh, how you decide um, uh, goal line technology or ball tracking or something like that, something to do with the sport itself. So for example, um, it'll have to be proposed by someone. So, some, so, so someone comes up with an idea that says, hey, it'll be a great idea if we uh, in, implement this or introduce this in the game. Uh, management will discuss that internally. Uh, they may then discuss it with the external advisors, such as uh, the media. They may sort of discuss it with the empires and referees, other qualified people. Um, if it involves technology, then they'll discuss it with uh, people who will develop that technology. Uh, and after doing all the homework and getting everything um, together, they'll refer it to the sports committee. And this is normally a committee that decides on all matters to do with the sport itself. Assuming that the sports committee like the idea, then they'll cost it, how much it's going to cost, and then the cost and expenses will be referred to the finance committee, and then the finance committee can review this and sign off on it. And then once all your boxes have been ticked, uh, the sports committee will then present this proposal to the board, and then the board will hopefully approve it. And this shows you that this particular decision has gone through various layers and analysis and discussion, and you've looked at it from a variety of angles, and then you've made the right, hopefully the right decision. On the other hand, if it's a matter to do with finance, and for example, this could be something like an organization deciding that, look, instead of, uh, uh, let's say, distributing so many uh, millions of dollars per annum to our members, maybe we should increase that or decrease that. So anyway, again, this is proposed by someone. It's again discussed uh, internally by management. Um, because it's a finance matter, it'll then go to the finance committee and assuming that the finance committee uh, uh, approves it after discussion and maybe some changes, it's then presented to the board by the finance committee and hopefully it'll be then approved by the board. If we look at something like team selection, so your team's playing on uh, uh, Saturday or they're you know, playing in this uh, tournament, how do you select the team? Well, there are a variety of people involved in team selection and you've got talent scouts, you've got specialist trainers, you've got coaches, the team captain will probably be involved in uh, naming the final squad. Certainly the sports director of the organization will be involved, the head of the sports committee may be involved, and finally the team selectors. You will have a panel of selectors who will ultimately select the team. So again, it shows you that it's gone through a process. It's not just one or two people making a decision, which is not good for the organization. So how does one measure effective governance for a sports club or a national association that's running a particular sport in a country? By results. So how's your team performing? How are your athletes performing? What's your team ranking? What are your athletes rankings? What is your win-loss ratio? So at the end of the day, you measure team performance by results, results, and 
results. Remember, governance is about outcomes. Governance is not about people. Politics is about people. You measure your success by your results. The organization must set a target and then measure performance against that target. So for example, your target could be that our team is currently ranked 23rd in the world. By the end of the following year, our team must be in the top 20. That's a target. You've now got to try and achieve that target. And if the results aren't good, then changes must be made or maybe even the governance structure needs to be changed because something's not working if your targets are realistic. And in sport, remember that the measurement of performance is relatively simple. It's only the results on the field that count. And they say that in sport, there's only one statistic that really matters. Who won? Second place is nowhere. Let's have a quick look at the governance structure of FIFA. Let's see who's involved in making decisions at FIFA. So you've got the president and the general secretary, who's effectively the chief executive. You've got eight vice presidents, 22 standing committees. That's a lot of committees, including a FIFA tournaments committee, a game rules committee, finance committee, many others. You've obviously got management, working under the chief executive, people who are looking at the game itself, football, people looking at the legal side, the PR and media side, the finance side. FIFA has set up six confederations. They've divided the world into six different uh, areas, effectively uh, continents, and uh, they play a part in the governance structure uh, of, uh, of FIFA. Uh, you've got the Congress, which has got 211 members. These are all the members of FIFA, and they decide very, very important things. They meet once a year, and they decide things as who's going to host uh, the next World Cup. And then you've got the FIFA Council. This is the most uh, important and powerful committee of uh, FIFA. Uh, it's like an executive committee, which has 37 members. So you can see that there's... Uh, this is a very, very high powered governance structure and there are quite a few people involved in decision making at FIFA, which is quite right because it's the world's most popular sport. And here you're talking about billions and billions of dollars uh, which are involved. So it needs uh, such a powerful uh, governance and decision making structure. So I'll end off by saying that Governing is hard. Good governance is very difficult. And the German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, to rule is easy, to govern difficult. That's so true. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.